So for those who are visitors or new to a Revelation study, let me just do a quick recap. During the first half of the tribulation, the world is increasingly attracted to a dynamic ruler who possesses seemingly superhuman wisdom and skill in ruling and discovering solutions to problems that have seemed insurmountable. He's popularly known as the Antichrist. As his popular support skyrockets, opposition rises from 144,000 Jewish evangelists, and they seem to be led by two very powerful prophets who centered their activity, their ministry, in the city of Jerusalem. We've already studied all of this in the chapters uh, of, of Revelation so far. These evangelists and, and these two prophets, they preach the gospel, warning the world that the Antichrist, of course, the, the world has received him as kind of a savior, but he is, in fact, the Antichrist, they warn that this guy is leading the world to ruin. And it turns out that millions are won to faith in Christ through their message. The world becomes increasingly polarized between those who are loyal to the Antichrist and his system and those who convert to faith in Christ. And then, at the midpoint of the tribulation, there's a dramatic change. The Antichrist is assassinated, or it seems that way. He then miraculously rises, causing the entire world to flock to him in a renewed sense of loyalty. But probably what really happens is that Satan possesses the dead body of this leader and stages a kind of fake resurrection. Doesn't that make sense if he's the instead of Christ? The last half of the tribulation then is his reign of terror as he ruthlessly seizes control of earth both politically and economically along with his chief assistant, guy that's known as the false prophet, he assumes control also of the religious sphere and demands that people worship him as God or be executed. And that's when he runs into trouble because some nations refuse to submit to his control, to his bid for authority over the entire earth. And that's what brings about the famed and fabled Battle of Armageddon which is what we are going to see tonight. Now, chapters 10 through 15 are background visions of what's going on in heaven while God is pouring out judgments on earth. And because they're kind of background visions, they're called parenthetical chapters, uh, because what we're doing is we're getting, a, if you will, a behind-the-scenes look at what's going on in heaven while judgment is happening on earth. Now, verse 1, chapter 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels. Those angels were presented to us as we saw last week in chapter 15. And the temple that's being referred to here, of course, is in, God, in heaven. And here's what this loud voice says. Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. Now, verse 8 of chapter 15 tells us only God is in the temple at this point. So if we have a loud voice from the temple, who, who's saying this? This, this is God. He tells the angels to pour out their bowls, which were given to them in the previous chapter. Now, we're going to read these last seven plagues rather quickly. Not a lot of comment because they're pretty straightforward. But before we look at them, I need to recap. We read here of seven bowls of God's wrath. Prior to that were seven trumpets of judgment. And then before that, the breaking of seven seals. The seventh seal was the seven trumpets, and the seventh trumpet becomes the seven bowls. And with both the seals and the trumpets, the first six are enacted on, and then there's a pause before the seventh, before the last one. That's not the case with the seven bowls. They're all just poured out one right after another in succession. Now, the word for bowl here is fiale, and it's, it's this. It looks pretty much like, like this. It's a broad, shallow bowl, a, think of it like a large saucer, if you will. They were found in temples, and what they were used for was collecting offerings. And so you want something that's kind of wide, right? So that people could get to it without having to like, put it in a box or put it in a slot. It would be something that they could pass by and they could just drop their offering in. In fact, it's kind of the plate that is used in many churches. You guys, ever, did you ever attend a church that they passed the plate? And that's for what? For the offering. It's that kind of a plate. That's the idea of the bowls here. 
The idea here is that God's wrath is about to be poured out of these bowls as the result of rebel humanity has given God over the centuries. So he's giving back to them. They only get back what they themselves have dished out. Some commentators suggest that these bowls that we're about to read out out, uh, actually are poured out simultaneously. The New King James begins each of the bowls with the word then, and we'll see that. I'll highlight it as, as we read through. And so that makes it appear sequential, right? Then this bowl was poured out. Then this bowl. And it makes it look like you know, it's one after the other. In fact, in Greek, it's the word chi, which is almost always translated and. So it may be that these bowls are poured out at the same time. Another thing to note is that some of these bowl judgments... They only sound like repeats of judgments that God has already given. And so some say, well, actually, this is just another look at the same judgment. Here's the difference. Those previous judgments were regional. They were over a specific area. These bowls are global. They cover everything, all right? So verse 2, so the first went out and poured out his bowl, his fial, upon the earth And a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So a grievous sore breaks out on those who have taken the hated mark of the beast and by doing so intentionally identify with his rebellion against God. As they've taken the mark, you you see what God is doing? He's marking them with with this sore. And the word sore here refers to an open infection of the skin. Notice the adjectives that are used to describe it. This is a horrible affliction. It's foul, and not just foul, it's what? Loathsome. No one's going to get used to this. They're not going to learn to live with it. It's a constant annoyance, and it's a fitting affliction for those who thought that the mark would initiate them into some kind of earthly glory. Because remember why these people have received the mark. They bought the lie of the Antichrist, be a part of my system and everything will be rosy. Well, now they're finding out, well, not so much. The Antichrist promised liberty. Instead, they're being burdened with something that's, well, foul and loathsome. Verse 3, then, and it's, by the way, it's the word chi, so and, the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it became blood as of a dead man and every living creature in the sea died. I think we're going to see in the pouring out of each of these bowls that we must be nearing the end of the tribulation because they are so devastating, earth simply could not go on much longer after these things. How long would the world last without sea life in it? Think about that. How much of the diet of most people of the world comes from the sea? We're not talking here just about fish. We're talking about seaweed and plankton as well. Plankton is responsible for the production of 90% of the world's oxygen. Did you know that? 90% of the oxygen that we breathe comes from the oceans, comes from the activity of plankton. So if all the plankton die, how thin is the atmosphere going to get? Kill the plankton and the air becomes thin. The Apostle John likens the water to that of a blood of a dead man. He's not saying it actually turns to blood. It becomes like that. Now, we know the Bible says the life is in the? It's in the blood. But the blood of a dead man lacks life. And that is what John means. All sea life is being killed off. The oceans and the seas, they're the circulatory system for our planet. You pollute the seas, it's not going to be long before the whole world is sick. Now, commentators point out the similarity to what John says uh, and red tides. You guys remember red tides? Under the right conditions, plankton experiences a massive population explosion. It's called a bloom. Plankton has a red pigment, and when their concentrations are high enough, they turn the seawater red, forming red tides. But these planktons, these blooms, can be quite destructive because when plankton die, they they give off a toxin. And if you've ever been to the ocean during one of these red tides, you notice how it stinks? It smells really bad. And the dead fish that wash up on the shore, 
because they're being killed by the toxins that are released by these blooms. Turning water to blood points us back to the plagues of Egypt, doesn't it? There are several similarities between the seven bowls of God's wrath and the plagues of Egypt. The second bowl resembles the first plague, where the waters of Egypt turned to blood. The first bowl that we just read was similar to the boil that afflicted the Egyptians in the sixth plague. Now, as we move on to the third bowl, we'll see that it's an extension, I think, of the second bowl. Look at what it says, verse 4. Then the third angel, or and the third angel, poured out his bowl on the what? Rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. So not only are the seas, salt water, contaminated, so is the fresh water. The verse 4 refers here to the angel of the waters. We've encountered a lot of angels in Revelation, haven't we? Well, here's one whose jurisdiction, whose realm is fresh water. And it may be that God has established angels as strategic places to protect parts of creation from the polluting, corrupting, and destructive plans of Satan. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 11, we're told that angels are serving spirits, ministering servants, sent forth to serve God's people. Daniel chapter 10, Michael, the archangel, does battle with the forces of dark, darkness in a strategic spiritual conflict. So we know that spiritual warfare is going on. We know that there's this contest between God's angels and, and the demonic realm. And it seems that as though angels are protecting certain realms of creation, but what happens during the tribulation? God pulls them back. And that's what we have here. This angel that's protecting the fresh water is removed, if you will, and instead becomes an agent of, of judgment. This angel with jurisdiction over the waters declares God's righteousness, his righteousness in turning the water to blood. After all, those rebel earth dwellers that we talked about back in chapter 13, they've conducted a last day's holocaust that will surpass that of the Nazis. Hitler's final solution saw six million Jews put to death. Stalin wiped out 10 million Ukrainians and other Eastern Europeans that he perceived as a threat. And as horrifying as those atrocities were, they prove that people can be convinced that mass murder is justified. The Antichrist will convince those loyal to him that it's their duty to root out and execute all who won't go along with his program. And millions of people will die. The blood will flow. And so what's God doing? He's returning blood on them by turning water to blood. You want blood? I'll give you blood. Verse 7, And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. In chapter 6, we saw the souls of the tribulation martyrs at the altar asking when their tormentors would be punished. So this voice may be theirs. These who have come out of right? You want blood? I'll give you blood. That's what's, that's what's happening here. And now this voice is saying, Lord, you're righteous. Well, these are the people whose blood has been spilled during the tribulation. And then now they're, they're, they were calling out before, Lord, when are you going to take vengeance for us? And here it is. And now they're saying, Lord, you're righteous. Verse 8, then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So something happens to the sun so that it doesn't just give sun burns, it scorches. Now this may be solar flares, maybe something has happened to the atmosphere, again, loss of some oxygen and some filtering, allowing more harmful radiation in. Now think of this. With no water to drink, it's getting scorching hot as a foretaste of the eternal flames that the earth dwellers are headed for. Anybody want to be on earth during this time? I, I, I don't want to be here. 
The sun is scorching. You've got no water. And yet they are so spiritually gone, these people, that instead of repenting, what do they do? They curse God. They curse God. Proving they deserve the judgment that they're getting. Verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. So this is a judgment by darkness, which is reminiscent of the ninth plague of Egypt. This, focus, this judgment is focused on the capital of the Antichrist's power. Think about this now. Here's this guy. He comes and, and he presents himself as the savior of humanity, right? Something's happened that has caused this great distress uh, among the nations, and he comes forward, and he's got answers, and people are like, well, this guy's amazing, and, and he seems to be godlike. He's, he's showing his, his power, uh, performing miracles, the power of Satan's working through him, and the world's like, this is it. This guy's made that evolutionary leap, and he's going to usher us all into it. This guy is brilliant. And, and then now, what happens? His whole kingdom is just struck with darkness. And it's not just darkness. The word refers to blackness. It's the absence of light. Okay, hold on. Is it dark in your bedroom at night? No, it's not. How many of you have ever been on one of those t- uh, tours of a cave, like, Carlsbad or Merrimack Caverns. You've been on that? So they do this thing. It's spooky. You're down there hundreds of feet underground and they shut off. They, they tell you, grab something, hold on to something and they turn off the lights. How many of you have you experienced that? Okay. It's freaky, isn't it? Because when you, you turn off the lights underground like that, there's no light. There's no light source And your eyes, which are open, your brain is saying, because my eyes are open, I should be seeing something. When there's no light and there's no stimulation going into your eyes, your brain kind of freaks out. And that's why they tell you, you need to, typically they take you into a room where there's a rail and they have you hold on to the rail because most people will just fall over. They lose their balance. You have no reference point and your brain like starts reaching out for things and your people fall down. So you have to hold on to something and it's kind of a freaky experience you kind of even lose a sense of what's up and down. Even though your gravity is pulling you down, you kind of lose your sense of that. And if you've been there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Imagine imagine an entire realm. If, if the Antichrist is indeed the leader of the European Union, all of Europe being struck with blackness. God, who is light. So you're, you want a world without me? There you go. Have, have existence without me, with any, without any of my grace. I'm going to give you just a little taste of that. No light. If there was ever a time when people have evidence for the existence and the power of God, that is it. And what do they do? What did they do with that knowledge? Do they get on their knees and cry out in repentance? No, it says they blaspheme God. God is giving John visions of just how wicked and corrupt the world will get and how deserving of judgment it becomes. And the world is getting to the place where those who will repent have repented, as we're looking now in our text. It's quickly getting to the place where where those that will repent have repented. And all that's left are hardcore, won't repent, blasphemous rebels. And we need to slow down a little bit with the last two bowls of God's wrath because they're more complex. The sixth bowl is the battle of Armageddon, which is elaborated on in several passages. There's no one place that details all of the battle of Armageddon. So we're going to have to cull it from various passages and synthesize it into a coherent picture. It's an important part of the end times. It figures prominently, as you all know, in literature and in movies And so we're going to take a little bit of time to look at that. We need to know what the Bible really says about Armageddon. So let's review the scene. We're nearing the end of the tribulation now. 
The first three and a half years of the tribulation are a false peace and prosperity that have been engineered by the Antichrist and the false prophet. They've secured that peace and prosperity by forfeiting the future. The fake peace and prosperity they managed to pull off is bought on credit, if you will, and it now comes time to pay the bill. Verse 12, then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now, compared to the previous five bowls, this seems mild until we see what it leads to. This sets the stage for the last great battle of history, and it is a doozy. The river Euphrates is mentioned 40 times in the Bible, and it figures prominently in the geography of the Old Testament. It formed the northern border of the territory that God had promised to Israel in Genesis chapter 15. The only time that Israel actually obtained the Euphrates River as its northern border was really when it, is when it was an alliance with others. The Euphrates River is 1,800 miles long. It averages 30 feet deep and between 300 to 1,200 feet wide. Now, until recently, skeptics and critics scoffed at this passage. The idea that the Euphrates River could be dried up was ludicrous. Others interpreted it symbolically for the simple reason that drying up the Euphrates was considered absurd. But today, we see the real possibility of a literal fulfillment in several dams on the Euphrates in Turkey, the most notable of them being the Ataturk Dam. 90% of the water of the Euphrates comes from Turkey. If the dams were closed, it would dry up the river and make a way for anyone who wanted to cross. And in fact, in 1994, the site manager of the Ataturk Dam was quoted in the Atlantic Monthly saying this, quote, It's true that we can stop the flow of water into Syria and Iraq for up to eight months in order to regulate their political behavior, unquote. So, interesting, isn't it, that you have this guy just make this offhand remark, probably prompted by the Holy Spirit as one more little thing to remind God's people, the Bible's true. Now, the word for east here, which speaks of the kings of the east, in verse 12, it literally is the rising of the sun. That's the word the ancients used for the far east. Now, verse 13, as we carry on, and I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Now, the dragon in chapter 12 is Satan. And out of the mouth of the beast, we studied that two weeks ago in chapter 13, that's the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And then, as we saw on Sunday, John inserts a warning to his readers from Jesus. Verse 15, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And if you weren't here Sunday, I encourage you to listen to the, go online and listen to the message. But then John returns to his previous subject, verse 16, And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, everybody say it together, Armageddon. So John has a vision of three demons that appear as what? Frogs. Now, as we've seen, there's a link between these bowls of God's wrath and the plagues of Egypt. You may remember that the second plague was a frog explosion <laughs> that made life in Egypt miserable. I love the second plague. So you have the first plague, the water all turns to blood. That's gross. And then the second plague, frogs everywhere. Just imagine that. You know, you like frogs? Frogs are okay. You know, they're not snakes. And they're not, you know, bugs. They're, you know, frogs. Okay, frogs. But just imagine frogs everywhere in your bed. In, in, you, you, you go to get a dish out, you know, you're going to make a casserole. There's frogs in it. There's fr frogs everywhere. Years ago, 
her family was on vacation. I was probably about 11 or 12. And uh, we're, we're driving through the Midwest somewhere, and the rain was coming down in buckets. And it had been raining for quite a while. We're driving along the freeway. And, and all of a sudden, we look on the road, and, and there's all these bumps. All, the road is covered with all of these bumps. And, and the tire, we start hearing this weird noise on the tires. And we're like, what is going on? So we slow down. Frogs. The rains were coming down in, in such a volume that the frogs were just, had just come out and were covering everything. It was gross. There's only three frogs here. They're demon frogs. <laughs> Their influence is global and it makes everyone miserable. You see, they convince the world to bring their militaries to a last great battle. Now remember, the Antichrist wants control of the entire world. There are a few nations at this point that resist his power grab, most notably the kings of the east that are referred to here. So the unholy trinity of Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet conspire to drag those who resist them to a final showdown. It's the Antichrist's plan to crush them and then seize control of these countries once their militaries have been defeated. So these demons perform signs. It's hard to understand unless these, these are somehow visible, right? I mean, think about this. If these are just spirits that go, how do they perform miracles? So what we're probably looking at here are men who are possessed by powerful demons and that may be why they're, uh, they appear to John as frogs. Because frogs are what? Amphibians who live in two realms, water and air. And what are these guys? Well, they're, they're human beings possessed by demons, so they exist in both the physical and the spiritual realm. So that may be why we're seeing them as, as frogs here. So they come and they, 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 apparently they have some kind of mission where they go around to the rulers of the world, the governments of the world, and they provoke them to show up to this last great battle. Their destination is Armageddon. Now there's been a lot of speculation on what and where Armageddon is. And there have been dozens of suggestions. All we can say with certainty is that, number one, Armageddon is a place. It is a geographical location. Listen, friends, this isn't some spiritual or symbolic stage of human development, as some have proposed. John says the rulers of the earth are drawn to a place. The word is tapas, and it means space, location, tract. We get our word topographic from it. A place on the map. And Armageddon is a Hebrew word which suggests it's within the borders of Israel. It's a compound of the word Har, meaning mountain, and Megiddo, which is a city in northwest Israel. The word itself, Megiddo, means rendezvous. So Ar Megiddo, or Armageddon, means the Mount of Rendezvous. This ancient city of Megiddo it lies at a strategic point, not just in Israel, but in the entire Middle East. In the ancient world, it was the very center of the civil civilizational contest for supremacy. We've been there many times. Every time you go to Israel, you visit Megiddo. It's on a hill where some of the most important highways of the ancient world met. Now think of the layout of the ancient world. There's the powerhouse of Egypt in the south, to the north is Mesopotamia and Persia. To the west is Anatolia, the homeland of the famous Hittites. Further west, of course, is Greece. A little bit further is Rome. To the far east is India and China, which supply great riches in spice and silk. But the great desert of the Arabian Peninsula forces the trade routes into a very limited belt of travel. And so the city of Damascus in Syria became the ancient world's meeting place of north, south, east, and west. Heading south from Damascus towards Israel, there are two routes. 
The lesser king's highway, that follows the Jordan River. And the far more important way of the sea that follows the edge of the Mediterranean all the way down to Egypt. And Megiddo sits on a hill right at the beginning of the way of the sea, right at the, at the inception of it. The massive plain of Estralon, also known as the Jezreel Valley, ends at Megiddo, where the hills then take over. On each side of the hill of Megiddo, there's a little valley through which all traffic has to pass. So you have this one city that guards the, the main caravan and trade routes with a huge amount of traffic right there. And as a result of that, Megiddo becomes one of the most important strategic locations in the entire history of the ancient world. Everybody wanted it. Egypt wanted it, the Mesopotamians wanted it, the Hittites wanted it, and of course as Israel then comes into the land, they, they want it as well. Megiddo becomes the scene of many famous battles in history. So it's a city with a long and dramatic history, so much so that the novelist James Michener uses the city of Megiddo, the archaeological uh, digs that were done there, as the basis for his famous bestseller, The Source. It has 25 levels of occupation and rises quite high over the surrounding plain. So I'm just going to run through some of the battles, some of the famous battles that took place at Megiddo. Joshua recognized the strategic importance of Megiddo and conquered the Canaanites there. Later, Solomon reinforced Megiddo and made it one of his uh, chariot cities where he st uh, stabled his horses. Megiddo's reputation is for the sheer amount of blood that has been spilled there. Listen to this. 200 separate battles have been recorded at Megiddo. 200. The earliest secular chronicle of a military campaign involves Egypt's Pharaoh Thutmose III taking the city of Megiddo in 1468. So if you, if, you were like, if you look at ancient records, what's the earliest record of a military campaign we have? It's the conquering of Megiddo by the Pharaoh. And Thutmose remarked that possessing Megiddo was equal to a thousand other cities. That's how strategically important it was to the ancient world. Then Gideon and his 300 men defeated the Midianites in the valley below Megiddo. One of Samson's key victories over the Philistines was at Megiddo. It was near Megiddo that Deborah and Barak, not Obama, uh, defeated the hosts of Sisera in Judges chapter 5. King Josiah died at Megiddo when he tried to interfere with Pharaoh Necho's campaign against Syria. And the last battle to be fought at Megiddo in our history was in World War I, when the British General Allenby defeated the Turkish forces there. And the plain of Estralon stretches out north and east of Megiddo. Because it's the most important city in the area, Estralon is called the Valley of Megiddo. Now listen to this. When Napoleon passed through on his way to his disastrous excursion in Egypt, he remarked, quote, If ever there was a place on earth where the last war must be fought, it is here. Now think about this. This is Napoleon. This guy was a genius for battle. He was a jerk. But he was a genius for battle. And, and you know what they say was his real genius? Was in his ability to pick where he wanted to do his fights. And he's looking at the area around Megiddo and he says, this is a perfect spot to have the ultimate battle. Esdralon is a a vast flat plain that could easily accommodate hundreds of thousands of troops and a vast array of military hardware. Only one place in Israel qualifies for Armageddon, and that is the plain of Estralon next to the hill of Megiddo. In verse 14, John says, The kings of the earth and of the whole world are gathered there to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. While demons persuade these rulers to come so the Antichrist can crush them, in the end, all they are doing is accomplishing the purposes of God. They come for what seems their own reasons, but in reality, they're assembled for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. This word battle is better translated war. This isn't just a skirmish, it's the end of the long conflict that began with Lucifer's fall ages ago. The war has gone on in the spiritual realm since the beginning. It's going to spill over into the physical world. 
And what we find here is the end of it all when the spiritual and the physical merge. Satan has taken physical form in the person of the Antichrist. He persuades the nations to meet. He intends to unite them by force. But he won't be able to pull it off because God himself will intervene. So who are the nations? Who, who, are, who are the players in this final showdown? Well, sorting that out is a bit of work. From many other studies, we assume that the Antichrist is the leader of the European Union. Verse 12 speaks of the kings of the East. In verses 13 through 16 of chapter 9, we read about an end times army of 200 million that kills a third of the world's population. Now, please hear me. An army of 200 million was beyond comprehension to the people of John's day. There was maybe 200 million people on the earth in John's day. It wasn't until modern times that any nation could field an army that vast. And even today, there is only one nation that can. Anybody want to guess what it is? China. Some years ago, a high-ranking Chinese official, hoping to intimidate the West, said that China could field an army of 200 million. Interesting that he would use that very number, isn't it? What allows such a large army was China's strict one-child-per-family policy. A population boom in China moved the government to pass a law that limited each family to one child. Now, in the Chinese culture, it's the son that carries the family name and is responsible for taking care of his aged parents. So if families can only have one child, guess what they did with the girls? They aborted them and, and practiced a lot of infanticide. We've got a number of Chinese uh, people living out in rural areas. They don't have ultrasounds and have abor abortions. They have a little girl, they kill her. Because remember, these are, the, these, they, these are God, they're people that are raised in a communist system. There's an, they're atheists. They don't believe in God. And so as a result of that, you have a lot of guys and not a lot of women. And because of that, these, these guys don't have the option to get married. And many of them opted for military service because they can't raise families. As you know, China has emerged as a global powerhouse. Their influence in world markets and global political affairs has exploded. We hear about China all the time. They forged alliances to counter the dominance of the United States and Europe. They're working hard with others to supplant the U.S. dollar as the basis for world trade and economics. But a problem has emerged in China. You may have heard about it. One that many right now are calling attention to. China's one-child policy produced a negative population trend. It's forecast that by the year 2050, Chinese pop, chi China's population will have shrunk by 200 million people. That's, that's two-thirds, 200 million people is two-thirds of our country's whole entire population. Um, imagine what the United States would be like right now if two out of every three people were gone. 200 million people are going to be removed from China's population by 2050. That kind of population decline is unsustainable and could trigger Chinese leaders making dramatic moves to get more women for their population. China isn't likely to abide the Antichrist's power grab of world affairs. So it's not hard imagining them marching west crossing a dried-up Euphrates for a showdown with the Antichrist. And on their way, as it says in chapter 9, they wipe out a third of the world's population. Picture the map right now. Picture China. Picture Israel. I'll be this way for you guys. China and Israel. And they march west. What lands do they have to cross to get to Israel? Some of the world's most populated regions of the world. India. And they're making their way. India may very well be allied with the Antichrist. And as they make their way against him in Israel, they kill a quarter, or excuse me, a third of the world's population. 
Verse 14 says that the rest of the kings of the earth are persuaded to come and join the fray. Either they're allies of the Antichrist or they join with the kings of the east to resist him. And when those eastern forces arrive, the battle begins. There's so much bloodshed. It looks like a river as described in verses 14 through 20 of chapter 14. And it's into the midst of this battle that Jesus comes again. And chapter 19 tells us how the whole thing turns out. We're going to leave that for our study next Wednesday. But let's look at the seventh and last bowl of God's wrath. Verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. And a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake. Such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth earth. So the battle of Armageddon ends the tribulation and is itself ended by the return of Christ in glory. The seventh bowl is concurrent with the second coming. It's poured out into the air. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2, Paul says that the devil is the prince of the power of the air. The word means sky. And it was regarded as the, the, the realm of angels and demons. So God announces to the spiritual realm that Satan's day is done. Man, I can't wait for that. His rule is revoked. He's going to be prince no more. God serves notice on the demonic realm that the rebellion is put down. It's over. And all of creation shakes at the authority of God's command. Earth shudders at Christ's coming. Which makes complete sense to me. Doesn't it? The one who spoke and the earth was created, when he comes in power and glory, it shakes. Now, earthquakes, till now, occur on fault lines. So they're regional, they're local. If an earthquake occurs somewhere, even if it's, if it's you know, 7.8, which is huge, 8.2. Remember the Alaska earthquake, I think it was 8.2, 8.3, was it? One of the highest on, on record. But it was, it was felt very far out, but it wasn't felt on the other side of the planet. This, this earthquake isn't going to be along a fault line. There's something that happens deep inside the earth that goes to the entire earth is shaken by this earthquake. Verse 17 connects to the first verse of chapter 15. It says, Then I saw another angel in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is, what? Complete. Finished. So with this last bowl, God says, that's it. My wrath is now complete. What a contrast between what God says here and what Jesus said on the cross. Here, God says, it's done, meaning his wrath has been spent in judgment on rebel man. The result is the earth is left hanging by a thread. It's devastated. Earth's population has been cut in half since the beginning of the tribulation. And the planet is now a burned out, ruined, blighted cinder. But what did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. What was? The wrath of God on our sin. On our sin. You see, you see God, God is, at the end of the tribulation, it's, gone, it's done. It's finished. My wrath is poured out. It's done on earth. On cross, it is finished. God's wrath for our sin was satisfied in the death of Christ. And while the world is left a blighted cinder, what we're left with is new life because of the work of Christ. Verse 19, now the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So the great city is Babylon. It's going to be dealt with in detail in chapters 17 and 18 that we'll look at next week. Here we just get a summary of its judgment. Exactly what John means by the great city of Babylon, we'll wait to see next time. The great earthquake that shakes earth splits Babylon and brings other cities to ruins. Verse 20. Then every island fled away and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly 
great. So the lev- seventh and last bowl alters the face of earth. It, it al- the, the islands, the idea here is that the shaking is so great, things that have been are high are brought low. Imagine you're sitting at the beach. We live in the beach community. We all know what this is. You're sitting at the beach on the sand. Now, is the sand smooth or is it bumpy? It's bumpy, right? Have you ever laid out your towel and you have to like pat down the sand first? You have to smooth it out to put your towel down? So picture yourself. You're sitting there. You look over at the sand and, and you, just, you just take your hand and you just kind of do that to smooth it out. That's, that's what God's going to do with this last ball. He's redoing, he's just, okay, the earth has been messed up. And he's, let's do this. Let's just, let's just wipe out all this crud that rebel humanity has done. Let's just, okay. And then we, we read about these hailstones that are a talent in weight that come, and they just, they just go to town on, on man's works. A talent in weight, about 100 pounds. You ever been in a hailstorm? Some hailstorms can do quite a bit of damage. I've seen some video of hailstorms where the, the hail was about the size of a softball. And the damage that's done to cars and trees is just wipe stuff out. Imagine a hundred pound hailstones. Now, where are these coming from? Well, in reading some of the judgments that we have of God, it's not hard imagining some of the, the water that's being, that's being, you know, just sucked up into the atmosphere where it turns to ice and, and comes back to earth. Interesting statement in Job chapter 38. God answers Job's demand that he show up and explain why Job has gone through so much trouble. And when God finally does appear, Job realizes how foolish he's been to demand anything of God. (laughs) I I love that last chapter of Job. You know, the whole book, Job's like, God, you owe me an answer. You show up and tell me why I've gone through all this hardship. And God shows up and Job's like, sorry. (laughs) Never mind. (laughs) And I picture some of these clowns today. Robert De Niro, who are so angry at God, and God's got a lot to answer for. Yeah, good luck with that. So, so God shows up, and he challenges Job. <laughs> and here's what he says. He says to Job, have you entered the treasury of snow? Have you seen the treasury of hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? All the way back in Job, the earliest, the oldest book in the, in the entire Bible. And God is already pointing to the last book of the Bible and the end of history. God knew what he was going to do before it all began. Besides all else that he does during the tribulation, he prepares an arsenal of ice rockets. With all the other cosmic disturbances and revelation, it's, again, it's not difficult to see how vast amounts of water and, and debris can be carried up into the atmosphere and then come hurling back. So now listen, this has to be the end, right? This, this has to be the end. With the ground shaking under their feet and toppling buildings, the sky dropping 100-pound ice cubes, God makes it clear that earth can't escape. There's only one sane response. That is, repent. But what do the earth dwellers do? They blaspheme. In Leviticus 24, the punishment for blasphemy was stoning. The people of earth have blasphemed God during the bulls, and so what does God do? He stones them. Proving they deserve their judgment, they just bring forth more blasphemy. I'm I'm reminded of raising my sons. For both my sons, Luke and Terrell, who's here. Hi, Terrell. (laughs) When they were about six or seven, both of them did this. They'd done something wrong, and so it was time to discipline them. Usually when I would discipline them, their response would to be, you know, okay. And they would they would take it and have a talk and they would understand what they had done wrong, and then they'd be disciplined, spanked them. 
And then we would you know, talk afterwards and they would apologize and admit that they had done wrong. But there, there, it always happens. There's this, they come to a point in life where they decide they're not going to put up with your discipline. And you can see it in their little face. They're like six or seven years old. And here you are, you're 40. And they look at you and they're going to take you on. You know, they come up to your waist. And it's no contest, but they think they can take you on. And you say, go to your room. No. Go to your room. No. You go out and they turn around and run to their room. And they go on their bed, they sit on their bed, and you walk in and you start talking with them. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Right? I think every kid, especially boys, they all, are, they all do this at some point. You're right around six or seven. They think, they think, you know what? I can take on dad. And they, they, they're defiant. And, and as you start to press in, you see the defiance get more ugly. Their face takes on that, that rage. They've, they make that little decision to themselves. I'm not going to put up. No. I'm going to stand up for myself. And when you see that, listen, you have to break that. Because that's that fallen human nature of rebellion against rightful authority. A parent is supposed to stand in the place of God for their children to raise them to understand and respect and submit to authority. Can I get an amen? amen. This is the task of parents. Raise your children, it says, in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We, are to, we need to discipline our children. To what? To break that rebellious spirit. And this is one of the reasons why we have so much rebellion in the world today, because parents have stopped raising their children. They want to be their friend, not their parent. And when you see that defiance, it has to be broken. You can't let them get away with it because it only sinks their soul into the cement of rebellion. And that is what we are seeing here. These people are being spanked by God, and what do they do? Until their hearts settle into it and there's nothing left. They won't repent, and that's why the end must come. With the close of chapter 13, the judgments of God have come to an end, and we reach the end of the tribulation. And yet there are several more chapters in Revelation. The next two and a half chapters are a parenthesis of visions that John has showing the final resolution of the age-old conflict between God and Satan. So what, what happens now is really John is transported not into heaven so much, but into a place of vision where he sees really the, the, the age-old conflict between, between God and Satan. And that's what we're going to be unpacking on Sunday and in our study next Wednesday.